Again, I want to thank you all for coming out on this beautiful day. There was probably a hundred other things tugging at you for uh, your attention. And uh, it's been a long winter, and, um, but we're glad you're here. Our scripture reading today, we're continuing in the book of Galatians. And um, before I jump into that, let me just... This is Paul's first letter to a church and his, this new experience of he preaches and teaches and all of a sudden as he has to leave because he's moving on, these other theological scoundrels, I think he would call them, come in and say, yes, you, 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 it's good that you follow Jesus, but you also need this and this and this and this. And so much of it is tied with Old Testament laws and traditions. And, and it's not that the Old Testament is bad, but what the law came to do is to tell us we can't do it. We can't keep this law. There is too much law in there, and there's too much folly in me that I need to say. And then we can rejoice that we have one. Well, Paul is seeing this pattern because a couple of churches later, the church at Ephesus, in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse uh, 27 and following, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God, but be on guard for yourselves and for all your flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church which he purchased with his blood. For I know after my departure, savage wolves will come in amongst you, not sparing the flock. And from amongst your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things and drawing away disciples after them, after people. That's what he has seen. This is the first time it's happened that he has seen it happen. For really, the Galatian church was the first church that Paul, uh, I believe Paul planted, at least the first letter that he wrote. And so he is really, he has got this kind of shocked indignation that someone would, first of all, say that, but more importantly, that they would follow that. He said, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? Why are you following this? You found Christ. It's not Christ and, it's Christ. So, we now pick it up at Galatians. Chapter 5, verses 16 and following. But I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh is against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. In a way, what he is saying is, when it's keeping of the law was really on the strength of your flesh to follow, he goes... And we have all failed at that. What we need is the Spirit of God. It's not that we toss the law. We just can't do it. We need the power of the Spirit that we receive when we receive Christ. For these, the flesh and the Spirit are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evidence, which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostility, strife, jealousy, uh, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, uh, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I warn you. Just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and des desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit as well. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. All right, let me start off with an illustration that the Lord gave me yesterday. This idea of the Holy Spirit, we receive it. We receive it, not it, excuse me, receive the Holy Spirit. It is a person. When we receive Christ, there's all sorts of different uh, dialogues out there about when we receive the Holy Spirit and it's added measure. The Bible says, 
You come to Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, it takes some time, I think, for the Spirit to start to move within us. My illustration is this. Back in December, Trish and I are walking along the beach, and there's this briars, and, and I see something, and it looks like it might be a cocoon. It might be some sort of animal or insect pod. And I've always been kind of a nature guy. And it was in the wind, it's just getting battered. And I said, you know what? And some of you naturalists are going to freak at this. But I just broke the branch and I took it home. And I put it on my deck. It had a stick on it. And I stuck the stick in this pot that we had on the deck. And so it was a little protected by the wind. And it's been there since December. Just sitting there. Until yesterday. And we plant, I planted seeds around it, and it's still in the middle of those seeds. Are, so we're starting, tr- about 2.30 yesterday afternoon, Trisha watered the pot. And at 3.30, I just walked over to it. And sitting on top of that little gray pod was a secrop, secropia. A secropia. Secropia. S-E-C-R-O-P-I-A, which happens to be the largest moth in North America. (laughs) And he's just sitting there on top of his little pod, flapping his wings because he's he's got this rotund, very furry, big antennas. It's about six inches wide. It's just, it is gorgeous. That thing was in that little pod up until... Two, probably 3 o'clock this afternoon. We had no idea. All of a sudden it comes out. I believe in a way that is how the Holy Spirit, he is, there is all sorts of stuff happening within us. He is rearranging this and that. And, um, but all of a sudden, it starts to burst forth into, you know, basically the fruit of that cocoon was that moth. Now, let me finish the story. And this is purely for the naturalists around us. I, when the thing hatched and he's flat, I said, okay, we now know what it is. I'm going to bring it back to where I found it so that he or she can meet whoever is, is close. I'm just going to hope that there's more there. No need. As I'm reading, I studied it last night. He said, these things send off this pheromone that will attract other moths like it from well over a mile away. This morning, she was not alone. <laughs> I had to do a wedding, actually. No, uh, <laughs> see, and so this, this um, so, so now they're, they're on my deck, and, well, they're, and, and I read, what do they eat? They eat apple trees, they eat ma- maple trees, and birch trees. Well, I have a maple on one side and an apple on the other, and so I will... Hopefully, trans- and they live for two weeks, the moth itself. It has no mouth. It has no digestive system. All the eating is as caterpillars, and then they just come, and they mate, and then, well, all of that stuff was in this little tiny, it looked like, almost like a, a, a wet grocery bag that had dried out, and it was crinkly, and there was no beauty to it, but there was a lot going on. So let me read something that C.S. Lewis said. Imagine yourself living in a house, and God comes in to rebuild the house. At first, perhaps, you can, un- you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew these jobs needed to be doing, and you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in ways that hurt abominably. And does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from you, from the one you thought. And he's throwing on a new wing and putting on an extra floor and running up towers and making courtyards. You thought he was just going to make a decent little cottage. But he's building a palace because he intends to live in it himself. So... Paul is talking about these guys who've
They've come and said it's, the Spirit's not enough. Jesus is not enough. It has got to be the power of your flesh. It's got to be the power of your will. And Paul says, no. Testament is one huge testimony of the fact that no matter how blessed, how scared, how whatever, we will eventually wander away into selfishness. And he said, Christ died to change our eternity, yes, but also to begin a process of changing us. And he says, you're going to notice that there's a clash between the flesh, which wants to serve itself, selfishness. It leads into this long list of things that are wrong. But the Holy Spirit, God, is at work in you. And he is starting to bring desires that you may not understand at first, that may even seem scary in this world. Gentleness in this world? Are you kidding me? I'll get eaten alive. Good, you know, nice guys finish last. Not when they're controlled by the power of the living God through his spirit. So, we've talked enough about the the sins of the flesh and all of that. But I want to spend some time going through this, the fruit of the Spirit. You see, that moth was basically the fruit of that cocoon. There was something going on, and really what it was is the fruit of the Creator, because the Creator, they say that they come out as these tiny, tiny, and they'll lay, when the, the, these, now they, they're going to head off and have plant eggs on these leaves and they're going to start eating my trees. But that's all right. And, but in that little egg was that butterfly. God knew what it could become. God knows what you and I can become. And we might feel like a little egg or maybe we feel like this little worm. And, and that, that worm actually, I mean that, that caterpillar, goes through five different manifestations of itself. It starts off as a little guy, and then it kind of splits out of his skin, and there's a new one. And then that piece grows, and that splits out of that, and it becomes a new. By the time it's four and a half inches long before it goes into the cocoon, and it's got all these different colored dots on it, and it's really quite icky. No, uh, it's really quite... <laughs> I've seen pictures. I've said, you could put a saddle on that thing, but it's... But all of that, all of those changes are part of God's plan. He put it in the DNA, in the original egg. Look out at these oak trees. You know, they all started as an acorn. The leaves this season were somehow in the DNA of that acorn because God, it didn't just happen. There are marvels around us. And the Lord just kind of introduced me to one yesterday and you know sometimes we want to say okay Lord I've become a believer and now by tomorrow I want to have all these fruit it's, it's, there's a process and we're going to see a little bit more and a little bit more I would ask you to be patient with yourself as a matter of fact I'm going to walk us through the fruit of the spirit but the fruit of the spirit is love. And I think that there's something necessary about the order here. The fruit of the Spirit is love. I said, it is an understanding that downloads to us. Well, I just, one other thing is, is what the flesh does, that's all does in the natural. We are now talking about the supernatural. Because the only way we are going to do this list of the fruit of the Spirit, what God wants, is we are going to have to shed a few things like our selfishness. But really, selfishness and so many things are based on fear. He wants us to live less fearful. Because the first one here, the fruit of the Spirit is love. You start to treat somebody like you treat yourself. Well, what if you don't treat yourself real well? We think, okay, the fruit of the Spirit is love, so I'm going to start loving other people. No, I think he's going to start to develop a fondness for, for you, not 
for how you want to present, but for the dear, marvelous wonder that God made you to be. How God thinks about you. Do you realize that your heavenly Father is very, very fond of you? Now, there are times where I have given him reasons to say, okay, fond of you, what you're doing is completely nuts, and he, he hasn't liked what I've done or liked what we've done, but he loves us and doesn't quit on us. Now, what the Spirit wants to do is to start to give us a view of ourselves and others the way God sees us. So the fruit of, first fruit of the Spirit is, do you know you're loved? And do you know that the guy who just cut you off in traffic is also loved by God? That is what he started. And you're saying, wow, that's going to be an acquired taste. Yeah, it's like wrapped in that little paper pouch. There were some extraordinary changes coming out. And we, we might not see them at first. I was really wondering, you know, come a month ago, I wonder if this thing survived those really, really cold days. It did. But the fruit of the Spirit, what the Holy Spirit wants to do is to remind us that we and every soul is loved by God. A guy named Carl Menninger was a famous Christian psychiatrist. And what he said is that I believe that somewhere around 70 to 90 percent of, of, of really nasty cases of depression could be cured if people really in their souls believed that they were forgiven. There is something in them that just gnaws at them. Now, I know all the stuff, we know more about chemistry and all of that, but... If being forgiven can do all of that, can you imagine if we really, really, really believed that the God who made us loves us dearly? Forget what everybody else thinks about us. Do not forget what you think about everybody else because that's part of the deal. I think that those two things rise together. Wait a minute, I, I'm loved by God and so is everyone else. It will give us a compassion for our world. So, and that's supernatural. That is the Spirit of God. That is, that is not us trying real hard. That is us saying, Holy Spirit, have your way in my life. Next one. Joy. The Holy Spirit wants to build within us a sense that every day the best is yet to come. A belief that tomorrow can and will be better. It might not be this side of eternity, but I believe even more than that, that, that there are some opportunities for us to demonstrate the love of God to ourselves and others. Forgetting what lies behind, I press on to the high calling of Christ Jesus, Paul would say. You're going to notice something in all of these. They're all a risk. There is a risk of loving yourself and others. Some of us have gotten to the point where, okay, I'm going to try to live no expectations, no disappointments. Nothing ventured, nothing lost. No, love will move us to start investing in the lives of those around us. And also moving in a direction where we start to put the Word of God and the promises of God deeper and deeper into our souls. So the fruit of the Spirit is love and then joy. See, we look for happiness. Happiness is what's happening. Joy, joy is not dependent though, on what's happening. C.S. Lewis once said that the difference between happiness and joy, happiness is Christmas Day, joy is Christmas Eve. I don't know about you, but my happiest memories are 
wondering what's tomorrow going to bring. I think God wants us to live with this sense of awe and wonder about what's tomorrow going to bring. That the God of creation who made me, who knows me, who loves me, has a purpose for me, and I want to be a part of it. Joy. Peace. Peace. Peace is an assurance that all will be well. I will not hate, I will not fear. I know years ago, I, when I was at Grace Chapel in Lexington and we were doing college ministry, we did this big event. We rented out Gordon College campus and we had musical artists and, and, and uh, also we'd have a speaker come. We had almost a thousand kids one time and um, we had... Randy Stonehill, one of my favorites, and a guy named Phil Keggy. Any of you ever hear of Phil Keggy? Well, Phil was a guitarist for a band called the Crystal Harp, a secular band. Somebody once asked Jimi Hendrix how it felt to be the greatest guitar player in the world, and he said, I don't know, you need to ask Phil Keggy. Now, because of that, Phil has kind of, when he preaches or teaches, he'll bring... Mr. Jimmy into the, into the mix as a guy he admired greatly and, you know. But he told the story about a concert, I believe it was in England, where Jimi Hendrix stops like halfway through the show, and looks out at the audience, he goes, if there's anyone out there who can help me find some peace, come talk to me after. Picks up his guitar, keeps playing. Two days later, Jimmy was dead from an overdose. Peace. That things will be okay. That I don't have to control everything, but I know who does. Finding peace. We think that success will or possessions will or popularity will. This world is starved for it. Jesus offers it. Love, joy, peace that all will be well. I will not fear, and I will not hate. And then patience. God is very patient with us. You know what patience is? Patience is being generous with time, that incredible resource, time. God is generous with us, and he wants us to be generous with that incredible resource. I've seen couples and, who are short with one another or they're short with their kids and, you know, and we, you know, often after the fact, we just kick ourselves. Why do we do that? The Holy Spirit says, I can help. I will help you to be more generous. One of the things is we need to be generous with time with our own sanctification. That little guy sat in that cloth thing for six months through the coal, nothing seems to be happening. And then at the right time, it breaks forth into this magnificent creature. Well, are you patient with yourself? Are you patient with those around you? Are you generous with time? You see, God has already numbered our days. They're all in his hands. We don't have to rush. We don't have to fret. He wants us to be generous with this gift of time with one another. You know something? Those first four fruit of the Spirit are all largely for us. We are, I mean, it, we, we, if we say, okay, I'm going to give you this pill, and it, 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 by the end, you're going to be more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, and more patient. Oop. Well, that's what we're offered, and they're all for us. Now, granted, when I am loving and joyful, and I'm, much, I'm not the curmudgeon I usually am, and my family's more happier than I'm about it. But the first thing that the Holy Spirit wants to do is some unique gifts just for us. Yes, they do impact those around us. And I think they also are part of our witness. Why are you like that? I mean, the little garden out there is dedicated to a woman named Eleanor Castleman. 
I don't know how many of I know I'm not alone. I wanted to be Eleanor when I grow up. She's just always smiling. And she was, I've never heard her say a cross word. And that was the Holy Spirit who had been in part of her for a long, long time. You see, and that same Holy Spirit wants to work in all of us. And the first thing he's going to do, he's going to make you more loving. You're going to love you more if the Holy Spirit has its way. And you're going to have joy that does not depend on what's happening. And you're going to have peace because you're going to be assured that I don't walk alone. And I, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And lastly, patience. I'm going to be generous with time with me and with those dearest to me. And even with those people who are invading our sandbar, coming over the bridge. No, sorry. <laughs> All right. When we get there, we start to go public now. Kindness. The Holy Spirit wants to build in kindness you know what kindness is? Kindness is, is basically getting generous with your rights. I have the right to that. I have the right to that. I have the right to that parking spot. I have the right to go past that guy who's been sitting on the intersection forever. Kindness. Those simple little niceties that we have the power to share with others. And yeah, it might be my right, but you know what? There is something very sweet about kindness. I have to tell you, I, 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 you know, Trisha, I find her to be the cutest person in the whole world, but I also find her to be the kindest. She is very kind with me, and quite frankly, I give a lot of reasons to not be patient, and, you know, I, I, can, you know, I, I can be a little, okay, I can be a lot boneheaded. She's extraordinarily kind. That's the Holy Spirit. He wants to build that in. You see, those first four, I think, are uniquely to change our interior. Love, joy, peace, patience. And then, okay, now we're going to take, take this Holy Spirit living on the road. Now, a lot of people that have, have been talking about the gifts of the Spirit, you know, particularly the supernatural. That's, I, holy, that is completely in God's domain. If and when he wants to download, now we all have a gift that can be used, but I believe it is, can, those gifts of the Spirit can be used in order to live out in a public fashion the fruit of the Spirit. We are generous with our rights. It can be giving up your right to a seat on the bus because someone else might need it more. It can be a lot of things. Jim Dobson, in one of his books on marriage, said he was working with a couple, and he said, when did you know your marriage was in trouble? And the husband said, when I got up in the morning, and my wife had been up first, and she hadn't put toothpaste on my toothbrush. But just this little, tiny kindness it says, I'm thinking about you. You know, it's the little kindnesses. It's the, you know, it, 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 there's a show out there where, you know, every once in a while, you get a car and you get a car and you get, that's, those are not the kind, those, that's, that's, that's unrealistic. It's all those little things that say, you matter and you matter and you matter and you matter. God wants to make us not defenders of our rights, but generous with our rights. Gentleness. What is gentleness? Gentleness is power used for good and only for good. You see, all of us have got power. As I said, Trisha's five foot two. I can beat her in an arm wrestle oh, two out of three times at least. But She's, but nobody could hurt me like she can. Why? Because she knows me. All that sacred information shared. 
She knows my soft, dummy side. She could humiliate me. She doesn't. She's got all that power and will only use it for good. That's the Holy Spirit. He wants to do that with us. It is not... When you get into relationship with others, especially a body, God wants to make sure that the body of Christ is extraordinarily gentle with one another because we're all broken. We're all hurting. We've all made, made mistakes. We need a gentle environment because as we know one another we start to build this power this power to hurt but also this power to heal and gentleness will do that you know I jumped ahead I'm going to go back for two of them goodness and faithfulness the Holy Spirit wants to build within us Goodness. You see, most of us get into the trap of, okay, I don't know what goodness is, but I'm gonna, so I'm going to settle for better than. You know, I haven't done this, and I haven't done that, and I know they've done this, so I must be better. So as long as I don't do, you know, the real biggies, then that means I'm pretty, no. What we're striving for is Christ-likeness. That's real goodness. Don't settle for better than. Because when we settle for better than, then we start to act like we're better than. And that blows up peace and gentleness and kindness and all that sort of stuff. No, our, our, our model is Jesus, which should give us a sense of humility, but also gives us a target to strive at. We won't get there this side of eternity, but may we be closer and closer and that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do for us. He wants us to help us to strive for real goodness, not just better than. Faithfulness. Faithfulness is simply a stick to itiveness. I will be faithful. My word to my Lord, to my friends. And you say, you know, but sometimes I just. I get impatient or I double book or, you know, something. The Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will help us stay faithful to that which I promised, to that which I believe, to those who I'm in communi community with. I will be faithful to those around me, not just in what I say about them, but what I listen to about them. Faithful. And I will be faithful to thus saith the Lord. All right, like I said, I jumped ahead to gentleness. The last one is self control. Self control is the Holy Spirit will help us to act rather than react. Let, led by the Spirit, not by fear. Not by FOMO, fear of missing out. That's a big one these days. Self-control. You see, we're saying, oh, God, if you would just make me into a puppet, I'd do anything you ask. But he doesn't. He wants, you already have my image. Now you will have my spirit. But, you know, just like every writer in the Bible... It's not the same prose or the same, you know, it's the same Lord, it's the same gospel message, but there was their own personality. Paul wrote very different from Peter, wrote very different from James. You have, you have four gospels written by four people from four different perspectives. Matthew, very Jewish gospel. Every time Jesus mentioned a passage in the Old Testament, Matthew wrote that. That was his personality, led by the Spirit, of course. All, all, all Scripture is God-breathed. Mark, Mark was a young man when he had first encountered Jesus, and his, go his gospel is very just the facts. 
It's, it's concise, and it's story after story. Luke, Luke was Greek. Luke never met Jesus, but he met the people who met Jesus, and he, they believe that he wrote Luke and Acts as a defense for Paul in Rome because he introduces it, my dear Theophilus, let me tell you about this gospel that Paul preaches. In John, it wasn't until years later, probably 40 years after the resurrection of Christ, that John writes his gospel. In John, it's a very relational gospel, refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Self-control. You're involved. The personality that God gave you, you know, if I can just become Eleanor, I'll be fine. No, he wants us to be us. But he wants to round off the sharp edges. He wants to get rid of the timidity or whatever it is. He wants us to be us. He made us. He knows us. He loves us. He wants to shape us, absolutely. So that the Spirit would control in our personality, in our... I thought, Lord, you, if you can make me six inches taller like my older brother, you know, then, then things would be great. And, nope. Self-control. Then he says, against, against such things there is no law. What he is saying is the law can't help you do any of these things. It is the Spirit. The Holy Spirit living within you. All of us, I think, are in a chrysalis state. Let me just leave you with a couple of statements from a C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite writers. The Christian does not think God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Two, God can't give us peace and happiness apart from himself because there is no such thing. God cannot give us peace and happiness apart from him, but with him. With the, that is why he gives us the indwelling spirit. And lastly, from a, a sermon called The Weight of Glory, Lewis writes, it would seem to us that our Lord defines our desires not too strong, our desires towards sin and folly, not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us through the Spirit dwelling within us. It is like we are an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is offered by a, by a two-week holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. You see, that list, he says, of the lust of the flesh, none of those lead to near the happiness that love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control can bring us. He is at work. That Holy Spirit is at work in every believer. Be patient with you as God is patient with you, but let him have his way. One of the things that will help greatly, talk to him regularly, read his word regularly. Because the Holy Spirit most often will quote scripture to your own heart. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this promise that your spirit will literally dwell within us and will remake us. And you are in that process. He wants us to love us so we can love others. Father, he wants us to get excited about tomorrow and not dread it with joy. Peace, he wants us to be generous with time beginning with ourselves and others, and on and on and on. Those glorious things that Satan wants us to devalue, but our souls know that is what we want, that is what we need. Holy Spirit, have your way with everyone here. In Jesus' name, amen.